Welcome, welcome, welcome. I hope you can hear me. I'm just need to check if I'm not muted. I'm not muted. Um, great improvement. So uh, we come to you today with the second episode of our disruption talk um, dedicated to spread more knowledge around data science, around data st uh, strategy. We aim to help you decide which data approach may serve your purposes best. Um, before we start, should any questions arise, feel free to pause them in the comments, like anytime. We'll try to pick them up at once. Um, if, the, uh, if the questions will be relevant to the things we'll be discussing um, at the moment. If not, we'll go over any other remaining questions at the end of today's webinar. If you were attending the first episode, uh, last month we focused on the pros, discussing pros and cons of custom development versus SaaS for AI solutions. Um, and if you're interested in getting more info about that, reach out to us like on LinkedIn, um, on drop us an email. Um, today, we decided to take a little twist and go with a more conversational flow. So joining us, joining me today, um, we have our own Grzegorz Mrukwa, Data Science Manager at NetGuru. Hello, Hello Grzegorz. Uh, and also Moritz. Spangenberg, our client uh, partner. Hello, everyone. Pleasure to join. Hi, Moritz. How, uh, Grzegorz, how are you today? I am doing good. Um, is my plant in the background still looking like a piece of metal? It, it is. is like a, a plant made by custom um, development AI, machine learning, perhaps. <laughs> constantly, constantly moving. I feel well as well, so let's proceed. Okay, great to hear that. Um, uh, today's episode, the topic for today is like data strategy, strategy enablement, four ways, four ways um, to discover how machine learning may improve your sales and also, I believe, marketing. Um, and I would like to start with the question because the topic may be kind of confusing. I find it a little bit um, maybe misleading also uh, at the first glance. So my first question is, what are actually these four ways to discover how machine learning may improve um, sales operations or whatever we may looking for? Sure. Uh, so to, to begin with, I would like to underline that this this is not like uh, these are four categories of solutions that, that we can apply. This is not like a clear categorization of those, but rather what kinds of questions you should ask yourself or what kind of priorities you have uh, that, that you should focus on uh, when trying to discover a kind of a machine learning solution that could help you uh, resolving resolving sales issues. So the first first area is actually discovery of the spots in your processes that drive unnecessary costs. So uh, you are trying to figure out which which part of the marketing funnel or which part of the sales funnel is actually driving this specific cost to to know where to focus further on. Okay, the so second, you don't, okay, mm -hmm. so so that's uh, that's more more or less around broad data data mining. So. You don't know what you are looking for right now. You are just looking for any cause that may be unseen or maybe go on some for some reason go unnoticed, right? Exactly. You're unnoticed on, on one hand, but on the other hand, uh, some costs that may not necessarily be relevant to your actual performance. So, for example, on a large scale analysis of uh, keywords that you are running your AdWords with, etc. Because there may be a lot of keywords that are that are performing poorly, but you still need to pay for them. So, so this is that area to discover those keywords which perform poorly on a large scale, and to to be able to identify that there is something happening. Uh, I've heard keywords. So, if we have any uh, members of marketing teams, uh, chief marketing officers, maybe head of marketing. Um, I've seen a few of those job titles at our signups list. Not sure if they are um, joining uh, join us live, but raise your hands and um, uh, give us a comment or at least um, show some kind of sign that you're there. Um, Moritz, what about the second um, way? 
Well, I think it, it really much depends on wh where we're looking from, where we're coming, right? So Gregor mentioned um, one opportunity or one, one angle would be we are looking basically from the angle um, of cost. <clears throat> and basically um, here, I would like to reduce cost. I think it's very important to uh, get basically those targets straight and that this will, this will basically give you the best angle to attack, the best angle to discover the best uh, ML use cases, right? So another possible um, angle would be basically I want to sell more or, or want to sell in a more profitable way, right? So um, and, and, and that, that could, for example, mean I would need to do a, a better job in understanding my customers uh, better or maybe um, by delivering better to them and by delivering them mean would mean, for example, by meeting them in other channels, right? So maybe I'm not meeting my customers in the channels where they're hanging out. Um, you know, maybe my, even, even when you're in the B2C area, maybe your customers are not hanging out on Facebook anymore and also not on Instagram. No, they're in TikTok right now, but maybe you didn't notice that. So that's why you should take a lot of care uh, to think about where are your customers and machine learning does also give you an opportunity to optimize basically your distribution channels, um, your marketing channels. Um, yeah. Okay. So we have two out of four. Um, if you can take a, a third as, as well. So the third one, and, and I will leave the fourth to Gregor. Um, yes, I would say, I would say another one, uh, basically, uh, another angle, how you could, uh, yeah, how you could look at it, uh, would also be that you want to, um, want to see how efficient are you with your own, uh, resources when it comes, when it comes to people, right? So what we, for example, also did see uh, um, with a couple of our clients and partners uh, and talks is that um, they do and did, did get overwhelmed with sales opportunities, right? So, but their sales force or their sales people, sales reps, the number of those sales reps that, that did not grow, right? So there, there would be the question, how can you in the best way make use of the resources that you're having, right? So that would mean you don't even have to, you, you wouldn't even have to save cost. It's actually, you want to grow or you need to grow without growing, right? So growing in terms of you need to handle more workload, handle more incoming needs and opportunities, but you don't want to grow from an SG and A from a, um, um, from a sales and general administration expense perspective. You do not want to put more salespeople on your payroll for different reasons. And one answer could be that machine learning uh, can deliver what we also um, very interestingly worked on. Uh, Gregor, I think we talked about some last time um, also. I think we can, yeah, I think we can dive into details um, a bit later during the today's uh, episode. And let me uh, hand the mic over to, to Gregor for the last um, discovery mm -hmm. phase or the last part of these four ways. Sure. Uh, so, so basically, you can figure out also how to improve all those conversion rates. This is something that Moritz partly, partly mentioned already. But here, you already know what are the bottlenecks uh, when you already discovered them, etc. And you can focus on a very specific narrow area that you want to optimize. For example, you see that uh, across a very specific registration form, you have a large drop of customers of registrations. You have a low conversion rate. So depending on the channel from which customer is coming, you can optimize the flow to better feed their needs and, and, and to improve the conversion. So, so this is resolving a very specific bottleneck when you already have it specified. So when you made a discovery on a high level, uh, how the flow looks like, you've already taken a look at the data. Uh, right now you have a set of cases that you prioritized and you are simply trying to resolve a single issue and, and this is this in this fourth way to, to discover this specific case. Oh, okay. Thanks for that. Thanks, gents, for this uh, introduction. Um, a bit of operational and also a bit of uh, philosophical. Um, I would like to start with a very basic question. So let's assume I'm the head of sales, maybe uh, aspir aspirational role for me. Um, but let's imagine that. So I'm the head of sales and why do I need much learning in sales? Is that the question that I should, should be asking myself? I guess I, I would, I would probably say, yes, you do need it. And probably Gregor will say, say you do not need it necessarily. <laughs> That's true. Well, <laughs> first of all, you, you would need to remember that machine learning is not the target here. You, it is just one of the ways to go. 
uh, what you need to do is to understand your customers at scale. And this is where machine learning can help you. So you need to understand what makes those customers come to you, what are their struggles, how to position yourself the best. I know you already have few ideas when starting your, your business. You already have some customer profiles that, that you are targeting, but then you are diving deeper, much deeper into understanding of what are their actual drivers. You already have a solution. You already have a living customer base. Uh, so, so you can analyze what are the actual drivers and validate your hypothesis. So it is not only about guessing already, but actually about making some uh, some uh, predictions, some analysis on the real data. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks for that. Yeah. So let me, uh, yeah, Marit, you wanted to add something, right? Yeah, I was just going to add it. So, um, I mean, of course, not everybody needs machine learning and also machine learning is not always, um, or it's not the silver bullet uh, for, for anything. But I think as a head of sales, as you are, Atomic, or interim aspiring head of sales, I would ask um, the question uh, to you, um, uh, what, what if your competitors uh, are using machine learning in different areas, and are you in a position that you do understand all the data of your customers and data that you're collecting uh, well enough um, already, right? So, or is there a potential basically to understand your customers better, to make more sense of it, operate internally more efficiently, and serve your customers better? And if the answer to that question is yes, I think the question is also that this is worth worth also to um, invest basically um, in the next step in maybe building a POC and see if a machine learning solution does make sense for me. Okay, uh, thanks for that. I do understand that you are trying to cater to my FOMO, like fear of missing out uh, syndrome here. Um, but actually you've got a valid point that uh, if you may be missing something, if I were uh, head of sales, I'm not, unfortunately, or maybe fortunately for that guru. Uh, if I were the head of sales, uh, I should be worrying or at least trying to figure out if there is any parts of the processes that I can optimize. Maybe I'm missing some important sales channels. Maybe I'm not, maybe I'm missing some bottlenecks that I can see without uh, applying um, data solutions um, uh, for the job. Um, but let me uh, confuse you a little bit um, and uh, switch my hat to the CMO right now, like the chief marketing officer, maybe. Um, Grzegorz, you mentioned uh, keywords at the start. Mm, my question would be, I've got so much algorithm uh, already um, from coming from LinkedIn, uh, coming from AdWords, from Google. Why do I need any more data solutions? Why sh should I be looking at them? Mm -hmm. Well, there are actually two parts to, uh, to, of answer to that question. So first of all, when you focus only on AdWords and on LinkedIn, uh, it allows you to address just the narrow part of the funnel. Uh, it does not cap uh, let you to, to capture the full process. So you are fo focusing mostly on advertising, but you are not uh, taking a look at the whole uh, potential customer journey. So, so you are missing the big picture. You are missing the motivations. You, you are missing a lot of uh, data, a lot of uh, context that is bringing your customer to you. And the second part is actually that both those tools, uh, either it is AdWords or LinkedIn, they require pretty expert knowledge uh, to, to operate efficiently. And even though it appears that machine learning and, and similar and similar approaches can exceed human performance into optimizing the, the parameters of the campaigns launched on LinkedIn or, uh, or through AdWords. Uh, we have conducted uh, we have conducted a study uh, operating on, on the campaigns that were already optimized by by uh, experts who were working with optimization of those campaigns for, for years. And we still found out some keywords that could be optimized and, and reduce the cost overall cost of the campaign, uh, in, but preserve uh, more than 90% of clicks and impressions. So, so there is still some place for improvement that, that is not necessarily spotted by human, especially due to the scale. Because if we are operating with more campaigns, if we are operating with more keywords, there is more and more to maintain. So this is also this part about scaling without scaling. When you need to gather bigger traffic, you need to attract more and more customers, but you cannot grow your team infinitely. 
Yeah, that that sounds true. Moritz, any any thoughts on that? Any to add? If not, I'm 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 in, it's not like needed. I may jump to another question. Let me know. <laughs> Feel free to jump <laughs> to the next question, Tomek. I think Gregor's giving a give a great answer to that. Yeah, so I will switch, and I, uh, um, the next question will be to you, actually. Um, uh -oh. Well, uh, as a client partner, you are a part of the sales team, um, and my question to you would be: What can machine learning or slash data science do in sales? Which parts um, of the sales processes, uh, sales teams, can be improved? Yeah, good question. I mean. Um... Uh, currently, you, you and Greg talked about the marketing part, right? And so if we now look at the marketing and sales part and funnel, I think there are like many options along, along that funnel that can that can be improved either in inbound and also in, in outbound uh, um, sales, right? So, I mean, if we look at the funnel and if we if we would say currently now we talked about uh, um, awareness stage, right? When we're talking about um, talking about social media and ads and those, those kind of things, basically making our customers aware that we exist, our brand, that we maybe have a solution offering, great value proposition, et cetera, PP. Um, then basically one of the next uh, steps uh, would be that for, so let's say you have a you have a sales, marketing or sales qualified lead, right? So there's a somebody because you did a great job in showing your brand to the, to the customer on your website that clicks, uh, I have an interest, right? So there's a call to action somewhere I basically, I have a customer, I have a buying, have a bu show a buying intent uh, by doing so. Now then there's a question as a in sales department uh, that, that we ask ourselves and that everybody in sales, obviously in marketing asks themselves is, what do I do with that kind of lead, right? So, and do I treat every lead the same? So for example, there, there might be an interest uh, um, from uh, me, but then there's also um, interested uh, interested buyer that uh, maybe comes uh, from, from Siemens and both click on basically uh, show, show interest in, in software development. And um, obviously it would be for the, for the party on the other end that's basically evaluating those clicks. They should notice that probably um, this click from the person from Siemens is probably a more interesting one because if they've done a good job in understanding that lead, they will see that more is actually from a software um, development company and probably he will not best be the best person to sell software development services to right so what what do i want to what do i want to do with that example uh, say what that example is um i think there's a great value in understanding your leads and opportunities and um, possibly also then using again uh, data science machine learning to focus your um, efforts on specific ones right so for example um um, if you have a, you shouldn't focus too much efforts in that situation on me, but rather put your, put the best people, put your A team from the sales team, uh, basically on the lead, on the prospect that came from, came from Siemens. And that focus hopefully will allow, allow you uh, then to, uh, um, uh, hopefully increase your sales, um, chances. So what that would basically the first part of uh, prospecting. Um, and, and lead selection that I believe, uh, of lead selection that is very valuable, I believe. Um, prospecting, since I said it, um, I guess it's another part, right? So that's also one part. So I talked about inbound and outbound before, right? And if we now talked about the inbound uh, queue, and if we, if we now talk about the outbound, more proactive sales-driven uh, driven processes, um, one of the first jobs the sales team needs to do is uh, researching, prospecting, finding, the right uh, targets, targets that have a good likelihood to buy, that have a good fit to my ideal customer profile, uh, and so on. And I think um, un understanding that uh, market, uh, mapping it uh, basically to the experience and to the process, the sales playbook that I'm foreseeing um, is also a very important uh, job, understanding the data, understanding the likelihoods um, of that different buying personas, and maybe even offering different paths to purchase. And, and that's, I think that's, um, I, I guess that's relevant for inbound and outbound, right? So um, what I mean with path to purchase, I think if you, I think it's especially re relevant if you have customers with a high customer lifetime value, so high potential customers, then you may want to invest in allowing different paths to purchase, right? So right. Let's, say, let's say Tomek um, is very interested in high luxury, uh, buying high luxury fashion, uh, right? And then you are um, identified um, um, on that website um, already. 
and maybe um, uh, sorry i would fire uh, the machine learning uh, algorithm that you hire <clears throat> on spot right now i'm <laughs> no not not my <laughs> That's yes, we've, yeah, yeah, we've, we've not understood it. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, <laughs> and then uh, it would maybe worth for me basically um, to offer you a different path to purchase. I, I will offer you a different experiences when you register on when you make a purchase because I'm pretty sure that Tomic will spend uh, uh, um, fifteen thousand dollars in my shop, right? So, and if I have that uh, potential, uh, those potential revenues coming in, I can allow to offer different paths to purchase different uh, different journeys there. Um, to be honest, that sounds incredible, and uh, I will um, take a moment just to say hi to um, all our guests. Uh, thanks for your comments. I see the comments from Dominica. Thanks, Far Farag, also for your point. Like the machine learning can help understand which marketing channels deliver the most valuable customers, so we can prioritize those channels and spend our marketing budget um, wisely. Um, I would like to take Grzegorz for the like the additional part on uh, is it actually possible to do mm -hmm. this all this magic stuff that uh, Moritz just described? How do we do it, Greg? Yes, it is. Uh, so so let's start with what kind of data we need for that. Uh, so so as Moritz already explained, um, there are some silent assumptions in in what he explained. So so we have three types of data here. We have the behavioral data, so we understand how the customer moved through our web page and from which channel they came, etc. Then we have demography, uh, and, and in the case of sales, this kind of demography is uh, rather specific because uh, the, the most important parts for us are, uh, let's say, company of, of our lead and the, the position in that company or job title of our lead and potentially other demographic features, but these are usually the most important. And also our historical sales data. So these are the three, the three kinds of data that we are using here. And uh, in, using them in different combinations can, can provide us, us completely, completely different opportunities. So when we want to identify uh, which, which channels were performing best, uh, taking the, this data from our historical sales and uh, from from the behavioral source, we will already be able to identify which of those sources yielded the most revenue. We will be able to measure this performance and also we will be able to optimize the budget allocation. But what is also important here, uh, we should monitor how are we saturating and this this marketing channel, for example, and because if we saturate it, uh, more allocation of the budget simply won't help us. So so these are the two elements. Uh, if we want to uh, optimize the the channel and the, the the budget allocation per channel, and uh, because we need to understand whether it makes sense to to increase that budget or not, and this could be realized with machine learning with those two data sources that I mentioned. Okay, so by, by mm -hmm. saturating, let, uh, let me just uh, rephrase and maybe clarify. Um, so by saturating uh, marketing channel, you mean that the situation that when you can spot a threshold uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and after you cross that uh, additional 10,000 of US dollars spent on mm -hmm. this channel, one will be actually the amount of leads or SQLs or whatever, the effort, the outcome will be decreasing, right? Exactly. This is this is especially visible uh, when when setting up the bid value uh, for for a campaign on AdWords, for example. So if you set up too big bid value, uh, it may appear that you are thrown into a different segment of of uh, the the companies that are advertising, and your uh, impressions and your clicks will decrease. So so we need to understand where are those boundaries to not to exceed them. Okay. Um, Maurice, do we have any uh, parts of the sales process that we may have left um, go on notice? Like we have like the identifying, mm -hmm. prospecting, identifying, what about like closing? Closing is a good point. Yes. Do we have I... a Harvey Specter on the call maybe today from the suits? Um, not sure if we have fans of suits here. Um, he was one. I'm the one. Okay. So yeah. are you the best closer in town? <laughs> and do you need much learning for that? Always, always be closing, they say, right? And say, yes. Um, yes, and that's actually uh, um, true. And hopefully, um, many, many closed wins, not closed, lost. So 
Um, yeah, but with, with regards to closing, right? So um, there are very much very interesting solutions and ideas out there. And of course, not only custom, but also uh, ready solutions, right? Some of them work better, some of them um, do not work that good. I think an easy, maybe an easy application of using machine learning also to help you close a deal is basically what, for example, Salesforce also introduced with their Einstein uh, Einstein tool for those Salesforce users um, out there. So Einstein is basically um, basically a tool that also supposedly, if I remember it correctly, is using machine learning to predict um, the, the closed win value um, of the opportunities that you enter into the system. And what, what they're doing and what, uh, um, what also, and I think what you can see there basically is the very easy and very straightforward correlations that uh, give you a better idea on closing, right? So and wh why do I need to do that, right? So I, I'm, I mean, from a, if, you, if, if, you, if we again change the perspective that Tomic would be our head of sales, right? I would also, I would also ask um, um, our head of sales, um, do you actually know? So he probably knows, do you know the pipeline, right? So are you aware of the sales pipeline that you're currently looking at? Probably he would say, yes, I know that. And are you are you basically looking at the at the weighted pipeline? And then Tomic would probably say yes, uh, it's weighted by probabilities, right? And then I would ask Tomic, so who who does weight those 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 pipe those pipelines into deals, right? And Tomic would probably say, well, the sales reps do it, do it themselves. Hmm. Are they always the, um, the best knowledgeable to know about the different influencing factors to weigh the probabilities of those sales or not? You could argue yes and no, and there's no right answer. And um, those kind of machine learning and data can help you basically by doing this. And the one, a couple of easy correlations that you can also see with easy applications such as Salesforce Einstein is um, what we also see in our system, for example, the more touch points you have with the customer where you have uh, created an opportunity, the more, likely, the more likely it is that you will close win that deal. Because looking at historical data, it has shown if you have many, many touch points, you've probably formed a strong relation, probably have to, you have discussed uh, many things around a possible deal and the likelihood uh, does um, increase that you can close the deal. However, um, that's not all um, how, how you can use machine learning in, give, in helping you to close the deal. Um, what, you, what you can also basically uh, do um, is to basically help your teams to predict the next best um, actions in your sales playbook, right? So probably you have a sales playbook that says you should uh, call, you should first uh, write an email to the customer and then you should write a LinkedIn message or send an invite or endorse him and then you know, use different channels and then maybe give him a call. And um, But the question is, which of those tactics do really work and how well do they work? Well, machine learning can also give you an answer to that and can basically also predict the next best sales action that a sales rep should take, right? And is that basically sending the third or fourth email or is it maybe using LinkedIn or is it maybe meeting that contact on Twitter? Whatever wow. it is, right? Yes. Yep. Uh, thanks for your good faith in me. Like uh, you have a great faith in me. Like uh, as a uh, head of sales, maybe I should reconsider my uh, career opportunities. But I would Please. like Jagosh to jump mm -hmm. in and uh, confirm: Is it really possible? Because it sounds a bit too good to be true. And the, um, um, as always, um, to the audience, mm -hmm. if you have any questions, don't be afraid. Please type them in the comments. Jagosh, is it all possible? Like the to build additional muscle for the sales team um, through any data um, data strategy, data approaches, machine learning solutions. Yes, it is. Basically, uh, what, what people are doing uh, already is to build a kind of a sales playbook. So this is something like sales playbook, but actually live and adapting to your client. So having a sales playbook, well, you, you are following the steps that are described out there, but those are pretty static. And you cannot adapt to a new a new customer or you will have multiple paths in this playbook and would be in, and it would be really, really hard, hard to follow. So it actually would not be a simple playbook anymore because it would not simplify anything. So with machine learning, you can use your sales history. You can use this demographic data of your client and to, to understand how you should suit your tactics 
and how you should follow uh, follow with the next actions uh, to to make sure that the deal has the highest chance to be closed. And you are simply using the similar cases and from your CRM that you know already were closed or that you already know were failed. So you can also make recommendation. Don't do that because this is likely to fail the deal. So so this is all possible. And with machine learning, you are simplifying this, this problem that there would be a multiple paths to follow and the sales rep would not know how to simply follow them. So you are just giving a very simple recommendation and machine learning is responsible for all this reasoning. And it may ex explain this reasoning. So, so the sales rep is able to confirm whether it makes sense or not, but it is still simple. They do not need to go through multiple paths in, in some uh, pumped up playbook of thousand pages. Okay, that sounds incredibly interesting. I, I, I'm really interested. Maybe I should really join the sales uh, team. But, uh, I can imagine myself as a sales rep arguing with the machine learning, tell me, telling me what to do instead of arguing with my boss. Um, but let's jump into some kind of details. I would like you um, to discuss um, two different metrics, um, sales metrics, like the customer acquisition uh, cost uh, and also customer lifetime value. Um, so let's start with the customer acquisition. Uh, I would like one of you to, to take customer acquisition cost. Which one will be? Grzegorz, do you want it or Moritz? I may start, sure, why not? Oh, okay. So customer lifetime value mm -hmm. will go for Moritz and if uh, there are any other metrics, um, so if you have any questions, um, maybe regarding other metrics uh, that we can um, have data um, or machine learning solutions to apply to improve, uh, let us know in the comments. Grzegorz, let's start. Customer acquisition codes, what's to improve? Sure, so we can start with predicting the lead value. So we may, may make sure that we do not overspend on a specific lead. So if we limit our spend on the leads that are unlikely to convert or will lead, uh, yield a low value, uh, we will lower our customer acquisition cost overall. Uh, we may identify whether we saturated or already a marketing channel. So, so we will not spend money where it is not needed and the cost will decrease as well. And uh, we may optimize the marketing campaign in very general, so we, uh, so we do not overspend on those keywords that do not perform well. Uh, so we, so we uh, adjust the keywords uh, for a specific ideal customer profile, etc. And then we can also prioritize our leads. And uh, so we make sure that we do not let our most promising customers slip through our hands. And uh, even, even the most uh, simple, the simplest example that comes to my mind is to actually uh, identify a few factors that you want to follow uh, when, when selecting your customers, especially in the case of B2B businesses. Uh, so, so you make just a list of few factors that you want to, want to take care of uh, when selecting the best customers. Uh, you do not necessarily need to identify the weights straight away. Uh, so, so you are just making the categories of, of your customers uh, in, in those specific areas. Then you figure out how would you like to uh, cooperate with each of them. And then you may do a kind of uh, logic, uh, regression, even in spreadsheet, to figure out what should be the weights for each of those uh, for each of those uh, specific attributes that you assign to them and it could be already a way of uh, streamlining uh, how to prioritize the leads across all your sales team so so you can focus on your ideal customer profile without any doubt across whole team so so even you can do that by yourself just using a spreadsheet that sounds great. Um, do do you have any like the examples, not theoretical, but maybe practical ones? To, 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 mm -hmm. Where we engage in any kind of this um, improving um, customer acquisition cost um, jobs, um, even if the proof of concept. Uh, I'm not sure if we are allowed to talk about it, but maybe some broad mm -hmm. overview. 
Sure. Uh, the, the, one of the examples I've already mentioned, so optimizing the, the list of the keywords. Uh, so, so we were cooperating uh, on the data uh, from, from a platform that actually already does some optimization. And they, they have experts who optimize marketing campaigns on a scale. Uh, so they are managing for you several campaigns, etc. They are producing lists of keywords and, and so on and so on. And they try to optimize them as much as they can. So there are already optimized mark, and there are already experienced marketing marketing uh, managers uh, who are optimizing the campaigns, optimizing the parameters of those campaigns. But yet we were able to identify a set of keywords, more more than thirty percent of keywords, which require maintenance all the time, and still uh, drive costs of the campaign more than 20% of the cost, uh, but yield less than 5% of the actual clicks on your web page. So these are all the keywords that you could remove and, and, and save on them, but without losing re in reality uh, almost almost any clicks. Okay, that, that's great. Um, Moritz, I'm not, not sure if you're raising a hand, you wanted to, to, no, to add something? No. No, no, I've just scratched my, <laughs> my head, uh, but I've seen an interesting question from Hans. Yes, from Hans, uh, from yes. I, I will just make it. You want to take this one, uh, Moritz? Um, sure. So what I'm reading from Hans uh, would be, oh, thanks for posting that. Wow. Okay. Uh, would it be possible to incorporate ML solutions and start recollection data iterating the models in order to optimize the sales funnel since the moment of pre-launch of a product, tracking KPIs, the, 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 the pre-launch landing page. Okay, um, so I've understood you're asking if an ML solution would also help you to basically test uh, pre-product before you launch a product when you're uh, basically um, operating in a very lean way to check if you are doing the right things. I would say um, theoretically, yes, but practically, probably, um, um, pro hopefully Gregor will back me up on this, probably not, because probably you will not have enough data at that point of time that an ML, ML model makes sense. So I think the ML model uh, will be a simple spreadsheet or any other kind of tool, which basically helps you to understand simple uh, simple correlations. Uh, what do you think, Gregor? I would say that collection of data is, is already a good idea, but collection mm -hmm. for, for analytics, like you have Google Analytics, like you have Amplitude or, or some other tools for, for collecting data, understanding how your customers behave, and uh, let's say mix panel also, these are good tools for that. But if you want to apply machine learning in the future, you should make sure that your solution for, for tracking customer behavior, because you are already collecting the, in the source of the data for specifically in customer behavior. Uh, you need to make sure that this data is not sampled. So you are actually able to work with each customer that visits your page. If you want to make a segmentation and, and some fast laning of leads and that, that visit your page and you want to shorten the distance between the customer and your sales representatives, you need to be able to work with each and every lead uh, as, as they visit your site. So for example, Google Analytics in this, in this area uh, uses sampling so it is maybe not the best choice to, to start with. It can provide you some insights, sure, but it will not uh, it will not build your data maturity to to actually apply machine learning further on. Yeah. So, yeah. Sorry, but I need to um, keep track of time uh, a bit, um, and I have that we have more questions coming, and we have still have something to discuss. Uh, thanks, Hans, for your question. Uh, we can discuss that. Uh, maybe we should actually do uh, uh, another episode only on that because that's a really uh, broad topic um, to have. And also, um, Grzegorz, I think that Far Faruk uh, has some comments uh, regarding your uh, previous um, um, previous customer acquisition cost, uh, uh, comments. Uh, so he's saying that it sounds like a scoring model. So prospects who have 80 pounds out of 100 can be considered likely to purchase, so we can focus on them. However, building a custom scoring model and which attributes to choose might be challenging, of course, and that's why Jago is here for also. And I'll say this call. So, sorry, I'm already uh, thinking about this uh, chief sales role. Um, sorry for that. Uh, we, we have also a question from Jan. Uh, Jan, we will get back in just a second um, uh, with it. 
Mm. I mean, with, with regards to what, what Farouk said, uh, Gregor, I mean, um, mm -hmm. what, what can be a basically beautiful scene, and maybe we can also show that uh, to Farouk if you're interested. So we did build uh, did build a POC, a proof of concept, for to exactly demonstrate this, right? So this proof of concept, a very simple web, web application, does show you if you um, <clears throat> do change the data on different kind of things, what impacts it will have, right? So for example, if you turn up the number of touch points that the sales team has with the customer, what happens with the probability to purchase? If you uh, turn up the number of emails that you have shot, uh, what happens with it? If you change basically the date, the duration that this opportunity is sitting in your system, if you change that, what happens to the probability? Right, and you can see a lot of uh, those changes uh, basically pretty uh, nicely there. So I guess that's, that's you can make a kind of a simulation. So so you can predict how how your action may actually uh, influence the, the probability of conversion. But these are actually two different uh, two different areas because one of them is in predicting whether the uh, deal is coming to a closure. Or the second area is to actually uh, turn your feeling whether the customer is the right customer for us, because that's the, that's the question everyone wants to ask our, themselves at some point, whether the customer is right to our business. Uh, and you want to um, extend that definition from just your feelings to hold your team. So if you have a pretty consistent definition on your side, you are able to turn that into a model and uh, stream it to your team so they have a pretty consistent view of what a desired customer for your business is. OK, um, thanks for that. Uh, I would like to introduce, uh, uh, um, I, I know I promised Moritz to take the customer lifetime value, but I would like to introduce the, some kind of probability a metric here, so I, I will flip a coin and it will be heads. <laughs> Moritz, you will take the thumb, it's heads. So, um, you, you are taking the customer lifetime value. So, um, <laughs> can machine learning help? Uh, well, I would, I understand that the question, uh, the answer will be yes, but how yes. can machine <laughs> learning uh, help increase customer lifetime value? Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I mean, customer lifetime value. Um, I mean, overall, machine learning can help you to, we discussed a little bit before, right? So it can basically help you to identify the, the best, the, the most promising leads, right? So customer lifetime value means uh, they should, those are customers that have a higher value, right? So we had the example where we talked about the Moritz from uh, NetGuru versus the uh, Max from uh, Siemens that are leads for a software development company. And obviously the value uh, for Max from Siemens uh, would be higher, right? So it, it's worth to focus on the sales teams on that customer with a higher value. Lifetime, again, is also a different topic, not that easy to um, assess. Um, but what's all actually also interesting, maybe not fitting into our episode here because we're fo focusing on machine learning, but also basically also interesting what you can do with machine learning when it comes to churn prediction, churn prevention, right? So you can also use machine learning very nicely to predict that a customer will churn by specific actions, maybe on the uh, on the lockout or on the cancel subscription page or anything, right? So, and then may, then you can basically stop this customer, the customer during the moment of choose and say, no, Tommy, please don't don't cancel my the Spotify subscription. I will give it to you for one month, for once for free, or you get the family subscription for free or uh, whatever. Um, yeah, but back to the topic, um, the customer lifetime value. So we basically can help you to choose the most uh, promising customers um, that um, um, are, are best for you, yeah. Okay, so like the... How that works technically, uh, Gregor would have to answer, I guess. Yeah, my question, because <laughs> we, we have a very interesting question, hypothetical from Jan, uh, but uh, I will just like you to follow up with the mm -hmm. saying what data is actually, it will be somehow related with the Jan's question, but what data do we need? What data is useful and what data will be just a garbage garbage in, garbage out? Mm -hmm. Sure, so on a very high level, uh, we have these three areas. We have this behavioral data, so it is a click stream. Uh, so how long uh, the, the user was on your web page, what they were clicking, uh, where they spent the most time, for example, reading maybe some blog post article. So whole journey that you can map, uh, you should map it. It is, it is easier to actually throw out a part of the data than recollect it uh, back in time because, well, this is, this is something that we cannot do. 
so, so if you are collecting the data, you can always uh, you can always throw out the part, but you cannot collect back in time and the missing part. Uh, so, so it would just uh, make make a gap for you, which you cannot use at all. And uh, then demography. So if you have a LinkedIn connection, if you have some other kind of uh, data enrichment that could provide this demography data uh, regarding the position in the company, job title, regarding the uh, company size, the company itself, etc., it could help a lot. This is something that a lot of companies is already providing in their CRMs. Often CRMs are already doing this kind of enrichment. So, so you can take advantage of that. And especially sales data because if you want to optimize some kind of a process if you want to focus on which customers should be fast lent uh, to to take take care of their of their onboarding process for example uh, we need to know which customers are the most likely to convert so we need this sales data uh, whether whether the sale was successful how long uh, how long the customer was uh, using our services etc uh, to to identify this in this lifetime value and to be able to adjust our actions appropriately okay um thanks for that any any uh, any additional comments from your side Moritz? nope so no okay answer. so let's go to this um retail giant that uh, actually is attending our call um like Jan. so Jan have a retail company operating 1000 brick and mortar stores across europe and he's focusing focus on creating efficiencies across the value path and he wants to introduce some machine learning solutions but he doesn't know what he really needs. Where do you start? And Hans is uh, asking about, could you repeat the free again? Um, please. Um, I think that the Grzegorz was saying that the free areas is like behavioral. So it's clickstream, uh, demography, uh, for example, um, data from LinkedIn and the sales data, some the, any kind of data that can come from your CRM Hans, uh, just to answer your question. And coming back to the retail company, where does this uh, retail mogul start? Oh, yeah, that's a good question. I mean, there are, there, there, there are actually a few areas where you cannot where you, where you cannot use it, right? So um, it's a, a, a little bit exaggerating, right? So I guess the first question would be if I'm having 1,000 brick and mortar stores, first question I would ask is so how how are you making use of digital as of now, right? Of digital channels. So, um, are you where are you meeting your customers? Um, where are you uh, where, where are you doing your marketing? And then the first question could also already be right. So, is your marketing using efficient channels? As Gregor mentioned, uh, this can differ a lot. And then the next question would be, how does your path to purchase look like, right? So, do I do I want to push and guide the customers to my brick and mortar stores to the physical stores? Or am I based, do I basically want to make transactions online? <clears throat> so that's a big difference in how you basically would paint paint the user journey and also how you could theoretically uh, could theoretically use machine learning, right? So if we assume that we are in a are in a model where you are <clears throat> probably want to operate your um, brick and mortar store for the next uh, years um, heavily or to some parts um, heavily, you probably want to um, guide your customers guide your customers to the store, right? So that means the first questions we have actually um, answered. You could use it basically to um, optimize how you're meeting um, the, the customers online, stage awareness, uh, marketing, what, what we discussed earlier. Um, and that maybe also can, can give you a first idea um, um, also already by helping uh, you with uh, demand prediction, right? So obviously that will not be the first or the only data input that we need that you need. But predicting the demand um, is a very important topic uh, in, in, in retail because you, you need to work with your suppliers, you need to order, you have complicated global supply chains. So knowing the demand actually is really key, um, basically to operate uh, your supply chain on a great on a, on a great level. And basically you can you can basically uh, you use that until the point of time where you would uh, where you would work with um, automatic what what you would call automatic replenishments, right? So the, what does it mean? So um, if a customer, if Gregor uh, walks to the uh, Lidl, Kaufland or Jabka stores of that uh, world and basically wants to buy a can of soup, but the can of soup is not in the shelf, 
the grocery store misses out on the purchase of Gregor's, right? I mean, it's only one can of soup, but if that happens a thousand times, it will basically affect uh, your, your top line. And um, you can use machine learning, computer vision, different uh, things basically to automatically see and automatically basically put stock, put basically products from your stock to those shelves uh, again. So, I mean, great examples. I mean, for me, the leading example that I'm seeing on the market is what Amazon is doing with their just walk out technology. So that's like a very complicated and tech heavy uh, case, obviously, right? But I think they're doing um, a, a great job and they're leading the space when it comes to really doing autonomous shopping, right? So guiding the user end to end by using technology through a touchless, seamless uh, purchase uh, that doesn't need any cashiers. So that's, I think, a, a benchmark. And um, yeah, as, as I've posted a couple of, I think last week on, on, on LinkedIn, something not to be underestimated uh, from my perception, right? right? So um, they just entered the UK market as well. So they are expanding outside uh, the, the, the US. And um, I think it's a matter of time when those uh, um, stores will enter um, also our home markets. Yeah, I think the first one just opened up uh, in London or something like that. Um, yeah. Amazon. Exactly. Yeah, so mm -hmm. uh, I would assume that uh, you would take Jan from retail uh, company first on the call, on the, some kind of discovery call, on discovery meeting, just to understand what he has already in place and not to rush with suggesting any um, initial solutions like, like jumpstart to any um, uh, specific solutions first. Mostly does not make sense, right? So, but the, the application errors are multifold, right? So you can use it for demand prediction. You can use it for rather bigger purposes where you have, of course, a single use case when it comes to autonomous shopping. You can use it for very simple things like personalized offers, right? So everything what currently works in the e-commerce uh, sector already, you could theoretically also augment in the augment in the in the physical environment, right? You can think of nice things, um, for example, that you, uh, if, if you're using an application maybe already for customer loyalty. So, for example, Lidl is using um, their customer loyalty um, app uh, quite heavily. You could also um, think about that you can basically shoot pointed personalized offers, discounts maybe, um, to that customer when that customer is walking through a, sh through a shelf where maybe they have a discount on the beans that Gregor always wants to purchase, right? And then in that moment of choice, you can basically shoot a discount uh, coupon to Gregor and he will, he will say, wow, the beans are there and I get a 10% discount. That's great. I should purchase them. Okay. Thanks, Maurice, for that detailed explanation and answer to Jan's question. Uh, Gregor, where would you start with Jan? Well, first of all, we need to align uh, any kind of vision for introducing machine learning or data in general with the priorities of the of the company that is asking, because it's it's pointless to suggest any solution when we do not know the current priorities. And there is always a vision of what is supposed to be improved. And especially for brick and mortar stores, there is a very, very interesting area how to bridge the gap between physical store and the digital part. So often there is a part in some kind of IoT introduced, and this may be repurposing the, the CCTV cameras in the shop, but there are also different opportunities how to approach this topic. Uh, and, and you can see different approaches on that uh, already happening in the shops. Uh, when, when you take a look at Lille, they have their application and Biedronka in, in Poland and uh, from Geronimo Martins, they, they have this small card that you are just showing at the checkout. So they are still collecting the data in this way so they can analyze the basket. They can analyze the basket trends if you, if you take the approach from the data analytic point of view. And at the other part, the side of the spectrum is actually Amazon, who does completely, uh, completely frictionless checkout without any cashier, without anyone. So it is completely automatic. And basically, bridging that gap requires a lot of effort, sure. But this can be done step by step. And those efforts are not necessarily so huge at the beginning. But selecting where to start and due to the variety of choices should be definitely based on what are the current priorities for the company okay thanks for that so i do wish uh, i do uh, well we wish you all the best jan so um if 
you will have retail company with the 1000 brick and mortar so even if 500 uh please come to us and consult um, <laughs> we'll be happy to um, uh, provide you some tips uh, and start some uh, optimizations and we have some time for one or two maybe questions i see one from um dominica let me do some magic here okay so dominica is asking uh, after what time from implementing machine learning solutions or any other data solution should we expect results so i'm the manager i'm executive i'm want to have like beats custom beats as um what's the should i expect any results after one month or like I mean, it's rather longer term game like the six months two quarter whatever it highly depends on the kind of solution that you are implementing and when you start counting the time actually because if you start counting the time from collecting the data well it may take a long of time and uh, especially if you start collecting the data when you start building your product and you start doing machine learning two years later so so this this kind of time measurement could not be and could not be informative but uh, and then it depends highly on whether you are able to provide the uh, full training data to the machine learning model whether you can measure it uh, somehow uh, in in objective manner or you are for the first iterations using human in the loop approach it is often it is often recommended if you do not have like clear and concise definition of, of what should be recommended when it should be recommended or there is no like 100 percent clear um, clear uh, definition how to how to approach some specific topic so it may be rather used to empower a person not to replace a human and then it becomes uh, less clear how to measure the, the gain. You can measure it uh, on based on, on the performance of, of each salesperson, for example, uh, but, but it really depends on a specific case. And this is something that we are rather uh, considering during design of a specific machine learning system uh, to, to make sure that we are able to capture this value. So, uh, as, as we are designing the system and we know what is inside, what kind of output we can expect, what is the delay, uh, we, are, we are trying to, to pass that information to our customer, but that definitely depends on the case. Mm -hmm. Moritz, any, think, any thoughts on this? Yeah, I, th I think it's important to try to come up with some constraints, right? So to um, work iteratively and to not have the ambition to now build the um, build a machine learning algorithm for the whole product or the whole scope that you're aspiring, right? So, but rather look at a POC, look at the proof of concept where you can make a constraint where you, where you would say, let's say, need a minimum amount of data, but will not take the maximum amount, right? So, we, where you would take the minimum amount of that minimum amount of data, maybe just from a couple of entities or points of the system, right? Basically, collect the data. And then basically make a proof if this basically works and then work from there on, right? So that's very important also to not, um, yeah, to be efficient with your resource uh, spending. Okay, I can see we have uh, mm -hmm. one more question coming from Farouk. Uh, thanks for the, the um, clicking the magic button. Yes, it works. Uh, Farouk is asking, how about the impact of machine learning on job market for sales professionals, probably sales up who are more involved in high value contracts would survive better. What's your take on that? So we'll yeah, start question. with Moritz maybe. <laughs> it's a good question. I mean, it's a, it's a similar question that we are also, dis uh, we are also discussing when it, when it comes to retail, right? So I think that's, that, that example is even more, um, yeah, even even more understandable for for everybody, right? So if we all, and, that, and the question is not new. So always when we automate processes, the question is always what happens to the human, to the human element. So um, and I guess I guess I'm I cannot answer for every um, company. Every company will make their own decisions on uh, how they deal with uh, human labor. But in general, um, in, in my view, um, technology will always should always serve to augment. The human elements basically of your workforce and to help uh, your um, the humans and the people to work better or maybe to focus on more higher value adding tasks um, but of course as um, if, if we're if we're looking at um, uh, companies enterprises whatever um, size um, of course you will uh, companies will also make use of machine learning to automate and also to to save cost and of course since um, human labor cost is one of the biggest 
cost factors in every company around the globe. It's of course also uh, used for drawing business cases on basically uh, reducing human labor, uh, human labor and labor cost, right? So, um, but that's a decision that every company needs to take. In my view, um, it should be used to augment and to help your people, to help the sales force, help sales professionals. Um, I mean, spending time on number crunching, uh, is, if you can basically give it to a machine, um, why not getting the use of a machine and then focus on discussing with clients, talking with clients, and those talks with clients, coming up with creative solutions, collaborating, collaboration, um, I don't think that is something that uh, machines basically, basically will take over in the next decades. Yeah, so basically that's mm -hmm. that's what Farouk is asking because he is wondering if the sales reps who are more involved in high value contracts would survive better and the shortest answer would be probably yes. Um, I, would, least, I would like yeah. to refer to the second part of this question because that highly depends on how we design the machine learning system actually because you can focus on bringing the most promising deals to the best performing to the best performing sales reps and you are actually doing a positive feedback loop so the best performing sales reps will get the, the most promising leads and they will simply be better and better and the gap between the best and the worst will be wider and wider so so it may simply happen that, that you have this gap increasing increasing and those uh, low performing sales reps will get the toughest deals to close and they will not be able to do that so it is still on the level of design of machine learning system. So actually, if your goal is not to, not just to close the, the top amount of the deals, uh, taking into account the value, uh, but also to empower those people so that the, your, your least performing sales reps could match those top performing, if that's one of your goals. It is a bit more complicated, but if you specify that clearly during the design of the machine learning system, you are able to accomplish that and you can bridge that gap instead of increasing it. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks for that, guys. We are, uh, thanks, thanks Hans for joining us. Um, thanks, Rafael. Uh, thanks, Dominika. Uh, thanks also, Farouk, for your questions today. Um, so, to wrap up, it's like more like building additional muscles for different data strategies, different data solutions, uh, what we have. Um, we can uh, use them in many different ways. Um, I would like to thank you for um, very informative sessions. Um, I enjoy it, uh, even though I probably will not end up in sales. Uh, for anyone interested, we plan to have more webinars like this around this topic throughout the year. So in the next quarter, you can expect something new coming from us. And we are um, very eager to get your feedback. So to get some kind of tips on maybe you could consult us on whatever data challenge you may be facing. Um, so to understand where we should put our focus, um, what uh, is there any specific challenges that you're dealing with that we could um, spread more knowledge around. So, and that's it. Uh, thanks, Gregor from Moritz. All data aficionados, see you soon. We are Disruption by NetGuru, and we thank you for your time. Thanks, guys. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.